Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest this week is publisher of the Music Business Registry, Rich Esra. But first of all, you won't believe it, but digital audio is actually worse for the environment than both CDs or vinyl. Yeah, a joint study by the University of Glasgow and the University of Oslo found out that Wow, the environment is actually taking a bigger hit, you wouldn't think. But what they found was in 1977, which was the year of what they call peak vinyl, in other words, the most vinyl records were sold, there were 58 million kilograms of plastic that was used. And that equated to about 140 million kilograms of greenhouse gas equivalents. Sounds like a lot, right? Well, in 2000, which was the year of peak CDs, it turns out that there were 61 million kilograms of plastic that were used, which came out to 157 million kilograms of greenhouse gas equivalents. Well, in 2018, there were only about 8 million kilograms of plastic that were used. So that sounds good, right? Well, the problem is there were near 350 million kilograms of greenhouse gas equivalents in the United States alone. Pretty amazing. And you'd say, well, why? Well, that's because all the digital storage and all digital processing means that there's a lot more power being used. And all that power is actually causing a lot of greenhouse gases. And it's the same thing with Bitcoin, we found out. The generation of Bitcoins, in fact, costs way, way more than paper money or just the movement of regular money by a long shot. Now, when we look at this study on digital audio for the environment, we find out that it actually doesn't account for things like transportation or packaging, or it doesn't look at multitasking. The fact of the matter is most of us listen to music, especially digital music, when we're doing something else. So it doesn't take all that into account. But even so, the greenhouse gas equivalents are way higher than any time during the physical product heydays. So that's really disappointing for those of us who really care about the environment, and that should include everybody. Maybe we're not doing the environment a favor at Digital Audio. Hopefully we can find another way to bring that figure way down to where it should be. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Also, get an expert analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. <laughs> now, here's something that's really interesting. There is a viola player that sued the Royal Opera House in London for hearing damage and actually won the case. It turns out, and I've heard this before, I've talked to hearing experts that have told me that it's not rock musicians that have the greatest number of hearing problems, it's actually orchestral string players. And the reason why is that the brass is right behind them. So when the brass is particularly loud, sometimes that can actually cause hearing problems. And in this case, it did. Viola player Christopher Goldscheider sued the Royal Opera House, and he claims that during a 2012 rehearsal, the noise from the brass section exceeded 132 dB SPL. Now, just so you have an equivalent here, that's about as loud as a jet engine from 100 feet away. So this resulted in something called acoustic shock, which is a condition with symptoms that include tinnitus, hyperacusis, and dizziness. Hyperacusis basically means that you're very sensitive to everyday sounds and it makes it very difficult for you to get along just in everyday hearing. So the suit was actually won last year, but the Royal Opera House appealed. And now it turns out that the appeal failed. And to go another step further, it turns out that the Royal Opera House, even in the interim, has failed to take any steps to protect the players. The Royal Opera House actually claimed that the hearing damage was justifiable because of the artistic value of what they were doing. And of course, the court didn't agree. So Christopher Goldscheider won $945,000, or the equivalent of $945,000. So it doesn't matter what kind of music you do, protect your hearing. It's a limited resource. And it's not guaranteed that we're going to have it all of our lifetime, even in the normal course of living. So 
If you're a musician, you have to take extra steps to make sure that your hearing is going to be good every day for the rest of your life. My guest today is Rich Ezra, who worked as promotion coordinator for a m Records and director of A&R for Arista Records, where he worked extensively with publishing and songwriting communities for material for Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, Dionne Warwick, Melissa Manchester, Tanya Tucker, Jennifer Warrens, and Jermaine Jackson, and various major motion pictures. Since 1992, Rich has been running the Music Business Registry Service, which includes the a r Registry, the Music Publisher Registry, the Music Business Attorney Registry, the Artist Managers Registry, and the Film and Television Music Guide. He also co-founded MUBU-TV, which is an online video channel dedicated to educating recording artists, bands, and musicians on the realities of developing a career in music today. Rich has also taught various classes on the music business at Musicians Institute, SAE, and the UCLA Extension. In the interview, we talked about the state of A&R over the years, the most difficult challenge that an artist has today, why fewer American hits go global, the biggest misconception about label A&R, and much, much more. I spoke with Rich via phone from his home in Los Angeles. I've known you for a long time, but I don't think I know your backstory. I mean, I know you worked at Arista, but tell me how you got in the music business. Wow. Well, you know, my, my interest in music started in high school when I used to go into the library and read all about the industry, all about the movie industry and the music industry in calendar um, magazine. Back in the 70s, there was no calendar. It was View. It was called View, and they had all the movies and music stuff. And I used to read that all the time. And when I turned 18, my father knew a friend of his in Los Angeles whose daughter was able to get me a job at Record World Magazine. And Record World Magazine at that time was a publication that was, um, it was one of the three big trades. There was Billboard, Record World, and Cashbox. They were three of the big, you know, music trades and had charts and so forth, along with, you know, different radio ones like R&R and the Redmond Report and so forth. So I went to work for Record World Magazine. I was the delivery guy for the magazine. I would pick up the magazines at the airport when they would come in and distribute them around to all of the newsstands. And it was a great job because it gave me a car, which is something I didn't have at the time. You know, I was 18. I had just moved to LA. I had the job for maybe a day or two and I was called into the boss's office (laughs) and they said, we can't keep you. And I said, why, what did I do? And they said, you didn't do anything, but our company, um, because of you know the size of our company, we were just informed that the insurance policy on you know our drivers on, on the car will not cover anyone with the kind of liability that we carry, anyone under the age of 26. And you know apparently because they were a big company and if anybody ever was in an accident, you know they had a huge policy on on their drivers, which I understand. And since they'd be liable for it, it was a work thing. And the insurance company's you know, request was that if, you, if we give you this policy, it has to be somebody who's older. So they didn't think about that when they hired me. So they had to let me go. And um, so I lost that job. And it was probably another year and a half, two years before I found an internship at A&M Records. A friend of mine who was my roommate at the time came home and said, I saw this notice on the bulletin board for an internship in radio promotion at A&M Records. And, you know, I guess you were supposed to be in college to get that, but I never said that I wasn't. I just, you know, went and and I called the, the thing and they called me in and I applied for the job. I applied for the internship and I got it. And it was doing, you know, radio, it was in the radio promotion department and it was, you know, an internship that basically meant calling all the radio stations finding out what records they had added that week, you know, to that particular region and giving the report to the director of, you know, regional promotion. And it was a great job. You know, it, it, it kept me, it, it sort of put me into the heart of what was going on in the music industry, what records were being added to radio. I mean, I was learning a whole new kind of uh, element to music that I'd never been exposed to, you know, how records were added, how, you know, I got to see, you know, what records were added where and when and, and for how long and what records they, they dropped and so forth, you know. So I did that for, God, I guess I worked in radio promotion at A&M for about nine months. And then I had heard 
that an internship, but a paid one, was opened up in the sales department at Arista Records. And I applied for it, and I didn't get it. And the reason I didn't get it was because the guy didn't feel that I was, you know, the right person to make a lateral move like that, to go from one internship to another, even though it paid. So I understood that. And he said, you know, you may want to talk to my associate in promotion because there was a promotion gig that was open. It was the Northwest Territory of the U.S. And um, I would be assisting the regional director of promotion. So I applied for that job and I got it. It was a part-time job. And I was at that time also working to support myself as the, um, as a clerk and night manager at the Beverly Hills hotel. Huh, wow. So, yeah. So, you know, I didn't have a car. I just had a bicycle and they were in century city and the Beverly Hills hotel was in Beverly Hills on sunset. So I did that gig. I did that gig and I just learned and I did it for a year and a half. And what was interesting is that during that time, I got to know the director of A&R. His name was Bud Scapa. And I you know, learned from that gig. You know, he was a very renowned music journalist yeah. uh, who had written a lot about music. And, you know, I mean, you can sort of look him up and, and see all about his history and crawdaddy and music journalism and rock journalism. Very, very bright guy. So what I would do on the times when I wasn't busy is I would help him. I would help sort through his office and help him sort the tapes and all of the stuff that came in and clean things up for him. And, you know, just help keep him organized. Cause he didn't, he didn't necessarily, you know, he wasn't an organized kind of guy, um, that much. So I, I would just help him. But, um, anyway, I ended up getting a, um, uh, a full-time job out of it after a year and a half, you know, Neil Portnow came in and um, into the uh, operation of Arista, and he ended up bringing me on full time into Arista Records, and that was in '82. And I was at Arista from you know August of '82 till January of '87 when I left to pursue teaching of courses in the music business full time at Trevis Institute of Recording Arts, and I did that from 1987. Well, I was teaching in 86, but I full-time from 87 until I left in 93. And that's where you and I met when yeah. I was at Arista. Trevis, we met. Trevis, yeah, yeah. excuse me, Trevis. Yeah, Trevis, that's, that's where I got the, um, uh, the full-time teaching gig and you know, met you during that era. And um, I also was teaching a course that I wrote called A&R, The Heartbeat of the Record Company, at UCLA Extension. Well, let's talk about A&R for a second. How has that changed from the time you were doing it to now? How has the job changed? I think one of the biggest changes in A&R, I think the work of A&R is the same, but the process is different. A&R, in, in, in looking back, at that time was a much more faith-based business. And what I mean by that, Bobby, is that you looked at your taste, you looked at your uh, abilities to identify talent as a label, as an A&R executive, and you said, I believe this act will you know, find an audience out there. Now, nine times out of ten, you were not accurate on that. But when you were right, the payoff was so enormous and the success rate was so you know, high or the success of the act was so high that it paid for the other nine mistakes that you made. So it was, you know, it was anywhere in the neighborhood of, for everybody, it was like 10 to 12% in terms of every hundred acts that were signed, 10 or 12 of them broke through and had success. Um, so A&R was a different business then. It was, you know, it was still, I mean, you did your research, but you did your research with local promoters. You did your research with local retail stores if people were selling records or if they had an independent release or if they were drawing large crowds. A&R today has become a totally different kind of business. I don't think it's faith-based anymore. I think the natural forces of the market due to technology, due to the ability to see what everyone is doing on social media, on streams, on the internet, on their websites, on the different platforms. Now, what I see the music industry has the ability, record companies specifically in A&R have the ability to do is, you tell us if there's a market for your music mm. via streaming, 
via social media, via these different technological platforms. And I'm sure you read a lot about them. There's more and more of them that say, you know, this is something that, you know, we're identifying as a hit record, or this is something that we're identifying as, you know, that people have interest in. Um, A&R has become much more singularly focused on songs. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with A&R today is that, and Monty Lippman, who's the head of um, uh, Republic Records, has talked about this. He said, you know, we've, we, we have a, a great ability to promote and, 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 and develop hit singles and hit records, but we're not very good at developing hit artists and breaking artists. And that's a real problem. That's a real problem in A&R today where we, you know, we, I'm talking like, you know, when I say breaking artists, I mean, where we have an ability in the industry to produce artists that the public or people have an interest in beyond their records. That's a very, very tall order. And we can name very few people that, you know, have that ability. It's kind of, that's the, sort of how you define a star today. A star is somebody who we have interest in beyond their music. And truthfully, there are very, very few people that fit that criteria today, especially among new artists. Yeah. Um, so that's, those, those to me are the biggest, most profound differences in A&R of the past versus A&R of today. You know what I find interesting is that A&R evolves like everything else. And when social media became big, your social media numbers, if you were an artist, they meant a lot. And first it was, if we go back to the MySpace days, artists figured out how to game MySpace so that no longer became a thing that people looked at so much. And, and then it was YouTube numbers, view numbers, and of course that can be gamed in every social platform that you can name in one way or another can be gamed. So if you look at it, you go, well, how much can I trust these numbers? And yet I have to, to some degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. And here's the thing is that, you know, numbers can be gamed and we see that all the time. You know, you go to somebody's YouTube thing and it's, you know, 60, 80,000 views or 500,000 views, but there's, you know, there's 35 comments. Mm -hmm. or, you know, and it, it, it's, it's totally incongruent with that many views. Um, you know, or social media platforms that have, you know, X amount of, of followers, but there's no engagement. So, you know, people today, I think, you know, in, 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 re in relation to your, your, your point, I think are much more in the business anyway, are much more um, attuned to that kind of um, trying to game the system where they see that kind of thing. It's much more glaring today. I think it's harder to do that in any kind of effective way as far as, you know, gaining any kind of, um, you know, career advancement based on those kinds of nefarious methods. Look, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I, I believe in relation to what you're talking about that the, the bigger, more profound problem around all of this is that the one quality today that is more valuable than money, than power, or market share is the ability to get people's attention. Mm. I firmly believe that. I believe that in music. I believe that in, certainly in television and the revolution that that's going through. I believe it in the movie business. And the reason I believe it is because the reason attention is the most valuable commodity is because it's the hardest thing to get. Think of your day, Bobby. Think of the day from the moment your eyes open up in the morning until they shut at night. How many times, you know, uh, a relative, a friend, uh, you know, a wife, a girlfriend, a boss, a, 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 an associate, an email, a text message, a website, um, uh, you know, some kind of professional relationship, uh, a, a blog, uh, whatever it is, is trying to get your attention. And how many things do you give it to and for how long? And you begin to see in relation to this topic we're talking about, about getting attention with music. Bobby, listen to my song. Bobby, check my album out. Bobby, come to my show. Hmm. How difficult that is. And the hardcore reality, it's no different for Sony or for Warners or for, you know, Universal when they're trying to do this. And if you don't believe me, ask them about the artists besides Adele and a few others that they can't get on Spotify, hmm. that they can't get anybody to write about, that they can't get any of the blogs to write about, that they can't get any press on, that they can't get radio to add. Trust me, those stories are out there. It's no, they have more tools and they have more people, but it's no easier. 
I'm just my my point is is that that quality of of getting people's attention is no, it's not something that money and power and market share can buy anymore. It used to be. You remember the era when it used to be when yeah. we all paid attention to the same things and far fewer of them. But we don't live in that world anymore. We don't live in that world musically. We certainly don't live in that world in the television space. We don't live in that world online either. We live in a world where we have all in this culture gone down 100,000 different rabbit holes. And if you want, you know, Chinese hip hop sung in Hungarian, I'll bet you there's websites out there that are adherents to it and bands that are, you know, doing that and blogs that write about it. So, you know, that's, that's the problem. You know, to this point, I was reading a very interesting study. I don't know if you saw it. It was fascinating that in 1991, the three television networks did a study, a very expensive study that they paid for themselves, which said, we want to know when the American public turns on the television, how many of them are watching ABC, CBS, or NBC. And the study was concluded, and it turned out that 91% were watching the three networks. They repeated the study 20 years later. Huh. They found out, not surprisingly, that only 29% were watching network television, what they, what, which was to be expected. What wasn't to be expected and what was really just alarming was that the 71% that weren't watching network TV, nothing dominated, nothing. Everything beneath it was 0.2%, 5%, 2%, 1%, 2%, Rachel Ray, CNN. I mean, this litany of, you know, Hundreds of channels. So the point I'm making is you can see in that kind of a world with those kinds of options and outlets, how do you reach people today? How do you, you know, if you're a Disney or whatever, get people's attention? And more importantly, what is it when you're successful? Are you getting their attention for? And usually it's for something like, you know, a comic book or a whatever. But it's, it's interesting in just keeping this subject on music when we look at um, – you and I remember a time very well, and it wasn't that long ago, when the number one song in the country, people pretty much knew it. Yeah. I, def I defy you to find anything beyond maybe, you know, 10 or 12% of people, if that, in this country that know what the number one song is, or have even heard it. You're right. And I remember there was a time when if you would travel, you'd go to Europe or you'd go to Asia, and you'd walk down the street and you'd go to a um, bazaar or something like that, you'd hear American pop songs and you would hear the big hits so the big hit would be worldwide and right. lately I, i've been doing a lot of traveling over the last few years and i have to say that no longer happens where you rarely hear the american big hits and i put that down to a couple things now bobby i put that down to a couple reasons why that's occurring number one i think it's occurring because in the past up until the 90s united states produced 65% of the music the world consumed and made 65% of the money. Only 35% came from the rest of the world. That's now inverted. Yeah. And part of the reason it's inverted is because the other markets of the world, like where you're traveling, what you're talking about, the experience you had, have really developed their own local markets. They've really developed you know, their market for their music. Uh, and it's no longer where America dominates. I was reading the article the other day, you probably saw it, where it's talked about how English is no longer the dominant, on a worldwide basis, English is no longer the dominant form of big pop hits. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think that that's to the heart of your point, which is that, you know, the American songs don't dominate. And it's, a, it's an interesting kind of time, because when we look at that on a bigger meta level, you know, one of historically America's greatest exports of the 20th century, I think, was its culture. You know, whether it was movies or music or television, I mean, you know, you, you saw that kind of thing around the world. And now, you know, for a multitude of reasons, not just, you know, that America's fallen behind, but I think the other cultures have sort of caught up and, and you know, they've developed their own outlets and their own um, uh, senses of music and movies and television and so forth. I mean, they take our influences for sure, and they incorporate them, and that you can hear. But on the other hand, it's distinctly indigenous. But I, and I like that. I have to say, I like that better than you know going into Asia and hearing a Drake song. Frankly, I'd rather hear the popular local material that's going on. You know, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. One more question about A&R, and then I want to move on. What don't people know about A&R? Is there a misconception about what that is or what people do? Yes. I believe the the biggest misconception about A&R today for those who are artists or those who are looking for A&R to so-called discover them is that the biggest misconception is that it's all about talent, that it's all about an A&R person in a position of power or authority seeing how incredibly talented you are or loving your music as an act and having interest in you. That, to me, is one of the biggest misconceptions that I think a lot of artists today don't get. Um, That we're in that period of transition where the amount of development, you know, where you need to be not only talented and have great music, but you need to garner, you know, an upward movement in your career socially, musically, live performance-wise. Um, is also putting an enormous amount of, um, uh, I don't want to say pressure, but it's an enormous amount of work on artists today. And I don't, my experience, Bobby, in in relation to your question is I don't think most artists today get that. Not the ones that I encounter for the last five, six years. They think it's all about their talent. They think it's all, you know, some do if they're really smart and they've been at it a while they get that, my God, it's not only about my music, but now I've got to bring attention. And, th- you know, it's funny. I saw this coming about 15 years ago, uh, and I'm sure you did too, where the old methods of talent discovery and the old methods uh, and the systems, the very systems we are talking about that supported and built talent were no longer in place. They had all died out. The artist development systems, the touring systems, the promoter systems that you know, it was a smaller industry. Now it's, you know, the, the famous expression of, you know, the good news for artists is that there's no more gatekeepers. The bad news for artists is that there are no more gates. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and, and, and the reality of that, the hardcore reality of no more gates is that something else, something else besides talent and so forth has become more valuable. What's the most valuable thing in a world when you open your door in the morning, Bobby, and 500 people are reaching their arms up to you saying, listen to my music? What's the most valuable commodity in that scenario? And to me, it's the ability to have someone somewhere get your attention somehow among those 500. And that's the thing that I see is, you know, to answer your question, is the biggest misconception about A&R today is that it's not about finding artists that you love, it's now, what about that artist? What are they doing? Are they bringing any attention? And the reason is, is because labels today no longer have the personnel, nor the money, nor the, most importantly than those other two, are the time mm. to take an act that they believe in and build them over two or three albums, you know, to where you have some kind of success three or four years down the road. This isn't that era anymore. And, um, Labels will not, they will not invest that kind of time. It's not even a question of money or, or, uh, or the other elements. It's the thing of time. They don't have the time to do that. They're not designed for that. And I keep waiting for the era or the time to come when, may, when who's going to be the first major label to get out of the frontline business altogether. Huh. Just be a marketing and promotion <laughs> element. And, and, and I think, Bobby, that day is coming. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not next year. But it's coming. It's definitely coming. Yeah, I see it too. There has to be a new version of what a record label actually is. Well, for instance, distribution was the big thing for a label at one point in time. If you had distribution, you were king. And it doesn't matter anymore on the physical side. Oh, yeah, there's some, you know, physical distribution, but boy, it's not a big part of the business anymore like it used to be. It's a dying part. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller each year. The physical part. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the Music Business Registry. How did that come about? It came about in the early 90s when I would help some of these smaller newsletters who were doing, you know, different kinds of like A&R directories. They would have like little things of the local A&R people. And because I came from that world, I would help them out. I would say, no, 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 no. Bob's over at Electra now. Or Jim left, you know, Columbia and he went over to Warner's or so, you know. And I found myself doing that a lot for these people because they weren't keeping up with it. 
And the idea hit me one day. I thought, you know what? This is ridiculous. I can do a much better job Um, uh, because, you know, I know what is needed. And I looked and I thought, you know, what is the big issue here? And the big issue was accuracy, timeliness. Directories in that era were done once a year. Mm, Those directories were all researched in September and October. They were laid out and designed in November and December and printed. And they were sold to you in January. By the time you got them in January or February, they were 35 to 40 percent inaccurate by that time. Wow. Okay, just due to the nature of that world. So my thinking behind this was when I thought of the registry, I thought, you know what, I need to do something that builds in obsolescence. So I'm going to do this directory, and I'm going to focus on one area, A&R, which is the world I came from. That's the only reason I chose it, as opposed to promotion or sales or publicity. Um, I'm going to do this every eight weeks, and I'm going to update it. It took me nine months to do my very first directory to get it all. And I thought, number one, I'm going to do something no other directory does. I'm going to include assistance names. Mm. The reason I did that is because I found that so much of the work that you need to get done as a publisher, as an attorney, as you know, with, with these A&R people can be done by the assistants. Yeah. You need to know who they are. And so I included all the assistants' names. And the other thing I included was the direct lines to the offices. Um, because if you called after like five or six o'clock, you couldn't reach anybody. So those were the two factors that I put in. And the third factor, of course, was redoing it every eight weeks and updating it and documenting all of the changes. So I started with the A&R registry and just built it from there. Uh, you know, the next one we did was music supervisors because that world did not exist. That world only existed. I found out in people's Rolodexes Mm. and it, it eventually became something that was quite big. And then I did publishers, and then I did attorneys, and then I did managers. That's the order that, you know, all the publications came in. You have different formats available of each of these as well, which is, is very unique. We do. We have them in print if you want it. People will pay for that. You know, we'll custom do that for you. We have them in PDF file. And for the more sophisticated user, we have them in Excel files, although we have very few people that do that. They are more computer savvy and sophisticated. Our Excel users know how to take the Excel files and pull it into a database that they use or a, you know, an email format or mail merges or things like that. But you have to have certain computer knowledge, a certain level of computer knowledge to know how to really use Excel files. But if you do, you can accomplish a large, large amount of work with a lot of people in a very, very, very short period of time. Um, that's the power of Excel files because, you know, you don't have to manually put in information and, you know, risk errors and so forth. And the final format we have is we have it as an online database that you can subscribe to. So, you know, whatever format people want, we provide. So I presume that everything started in print and now I would imagine that most consumption is electronic. Correct. Yes. It's 95% of our business. And how long have you been doing it? Since 1992, April of 92. So it's uh, 27 years next, about a month. Okay, besides the fact of the format change and the fact that now you can pretty much change things on the fly a lot easier than than at one point in time, how has it changed? It's changed in, I mean, the, the best way I can describe it is that, you know, when the industry was so much bigger in the 90s and the major labels had far more subsidiaries and, and labels to them, there were far more changes. People came and went in, in label A&R and in publishing and, and in law firms. They came and went on a far greater frequency than they do today. The industry's pretty much settled down. I don't have 60 changes per book the way I used to, where, you know, Bob went to Warner's and this one left the company. And, you know, this one, you know, in the end of the year, I had, you know, 60 people that left A&R and I had 55 people that joined. You know, I don't have those kinds of uh, dramatic swings. You don't see people leaving jobs in A&R every 20 minutes the way you used to. That just, uh, first of all, there's not as many companies. Second of all, when, we, when I started the, in the business, there were six major labels. There's now three. So there's not as many companies that employ people. The other element of the business, too, Bobby, as you well know, is that there are not as many artists on the rosters of the major labels. That's something nobody talks about. You know, Columbia Records used to have an A&R department of 18 people. 
Well, that was commensurate with the fact that they had 217 acts on the roster. Yeah, right. You know, they have six. They have 62 today. Okay, you know, this, this is a profound difference. Interscope at one time had 140 acts. You know, I think today they have 43. So, you know, it's it, it's a different business today in terms of the volume uh, of of talent that's being signed and the volume of records that are being put out. Record producers, you know, used to be highly employed in the 80s and 90s because there was so much work for them to do with with those kinds of rosters. You know, you needed lots of records made and lots of things done. That's the big difference today. So, you know, I don't see the changes the way that I once did. Music publishing, even more stable. You know, not as stable as the attorneys, but even more stable. I mean, they don't leave their jobs. They're there. I, I just redid the whole music publisher directory. And I mean, I... I could tell you it was less than less than 10% change in the entire directory. And that's LA, New York, Nashville, London, Chicago, Atlanta, Vancouver, and Toronto. So, you know, less than 10% change from the previous year. So it's, you know, it's, it's a fairly, it's a much more stable business today. That's, that's what I would say uh, in relation to your question. What's the reason for that, do you think? I think it's because the industry has kind of settled down. I think it's because... Um, there's not as many companies doing this anymore. I think we have to look at the the landscape of what we're talking about. The whole major business that employs a lot of people has become much smaller. What has increased in size is the independent sector. The independent, people don't talk about that enough. The independent sector of music, especially on the recorded music side, is 40% of the world market. 40%, 40%, okay, it, 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 you know, in, in the 80s, it was like, I think, you know, 10 or 12%, 15 maybe in certain markets. It's 40% of the market today, and there's good reason for that. And it's because, you know, you no longer need, you know, the enormous amount of financial resources to record and make music and to market it, um, you know. So that that's, I think, one of the main reasons for it uh, is is that. And I think that, you know, there's more, there's more players, there's more options uh, in it. And, and one of the other reasons, and I don't know if this is really a, um, this is something that, you know, a lot of people talked about when, like, when you and I spoke last week at the, at the interviews, um, is that the A&R community is experiencing something <laughs> in the last five, ten years, I'm told more consistently that they've never experienced before, which is finding artists that they love that don't want to sign with major labels. <laughs> that, 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 that's something that, that, and that's a very real thing. That's, it's very real. That's not like, you know, some sort of weird outlier thing that, you know, one in 600 examples can be shown. It's very real. And part of the reason for that are the new models that are out there. The AWOLs, the BMG label services, the human resources, the, different kinds of companies that exist to help artists market music. Um, these have actually had a profound impact on changing label A&R policies that if major label A&R policies didn't change, they, they couldn't be in the game anymore. Um, and I know this for a fact because the, the managers of these artists have said this to me, you know, where like Sony is wanting this, this, and this, but BMG will give me this. And it's like, Sony, you either step up or you're out. You know, and when Sony and Warners and Universal hear this enough and enough and enough and enough and enough, they start, you know, having to reevaluate the way that they they operate. So th- th- those are all some of the reasons, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never one, Bobby, as you well know, in, in your own work, I'm never one to believe that something is always for one reason and one reason only. I think there's a multitude of reasons to to answer your question why certain things have occurred and that's that's just some of the reasons, you know, a smaller marketplace, a larger independent sector, an ability to market music on your own. And I think also that there are fewer artists being signed today. And I believe that for the artistic community, there's far more options available than there used to be. What do you think of the vinyl revolution, so to speak? Is it a mirage? No, I don't think it's a mirage. I think it's 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 mis it's misleading in the sense that when I look at the vinyl revolution, it's, it's being evaluated from ground zero. And of course, when, you know, when we got rid of all the pressing plants, you and I remember when all the retail stores reconfigured themselves and you know, went from 12 by 12 spaces to you know, five inch by 12 spaces. I remember that. And the thing is, is that the vinyl, if we look at the vinyl reality, um, 
it's a small business. It's only 3% of the income of music. It's growing. Um, but it's it's not something that I think will ever take over mainstream in the same way that I see CD shrinking. I don't see them completely going away. I think they will become like vinyl. I think in five years we'll be having a conversation. You and I will be like, you know, oh, did you see they released that in a CD? You know, <laughs> or you can actually get it in a physical format. I think what's exciting about the vinyl revolution to me is that it's not people our age that are um, supporting that. It's people who are in their 20s who are supporting the vinyl revolution. Um, on a technical side, what I find interesting is that, you know, if, if an album is done on tape, you know, from an analog, 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 and you produce an analog master, it sounds wonderful on vinyl. But when you do albums in a pure digital format and put them on vinyl, it's, there's a certain skill set to making it sound good. Yeah, right. And I find when I've listened to certain vinyl that's not done in that, it's kind of like, Ugh. I just had a, a mastering engineer who only cuts vinyl on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me, first of all, there's six new pressing plants that are coming online, if you can believe that. Yeah, because there's only 32 in the country, so six more, that's fantastic, good for them. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, he, he was saying that he refuses to do anything that's not up to a certain standard quality-wise, where it's like, you know what, you can do what you do, and this will work on CD. It's not going to work on vinyl, so unless you want to do it my way and make it sound really good, I'm not going to do it. He has plenty of work, so he doesn't have to bend to the dollar, so to speak. So I think that's a great thing, that we're getting some of that now. I totally agree with you. It's something I've heard from other people, too, who, you know, I heard this from a mastering engineer who worked, I'm not going to name his name, but he worked for a very, very prominent mastering house. He said the same thing, and he said... Part of this, he said, the majority of this consciousness comes from the fact that too many people can make music today and not enough people are making it who really know what they're doing. And they turn over, you know, half-baked essence to us and expect us to turn it into, you know, uh, be miracle workers. And, you know, we don't have that skill set. It's kind of like that, that comment I made to you, I think, when you and I met, where I said, you know, I remember when Pro Tools came out and Phil Ramone at his AES uh, speech said, you know, a little information is a very, very dangerous thing. <laughs> and yeah. this, is what, this is what this mastering engineer, I believe, in its essence, is really talking about. He's talking about people who know how to record, but not really, and they give what they do to him and expect it to be like, you know... And the amount of work, time, energy, effort, and commitment it takes to turn something like that into something great, as you well know, because you've been in the heart of that for years, is very, very, very difficult, and you can't do it. So, therefore, yeah, I get it. People have to up their game. Not everybody, just because you can record something doesn't mean that you're an engineer. Just because you can, you know, make music doesn't mean that you're a producer. Just because you own a hammer doesn't mean you know how to swing it. Absolutely. Or build a house or, or construct anything, you know? So, yeah, I mean, so yeah, it's, we can, we can point to dozens of examples that are masterpieces in the world of vinyl, you know, great classic examples of, you know, some of the most brilliant, you know, analog recordings of, you know, of, of, and most of them are from an era gone by, but they still hold up by today's standards. Yeah, they do. You know, feats of engineering and, and, you know, brilliant people who really knew what they were doing. There are people who really know what they're doing today, but they're few and far between. And, you know, we can name them. Uh, it's not like, you know, just because everybody can record doesn't mean that everybody has that skill set. And that's, that's, that's part of the challenge today of, you know, wading through. And, and I see that in pro studios, by the way, too, Bobby, and I'm sure you do as well, where you're like, really? you're working as an engineer and this, this is what you're doing. Wow. Okay. It's like, man, change. <laughs> a little success can make you think, you know, more than you do. And, and we see that a lot, I think. Yes, absolutely. Have you ever received any business advice from somebody or maybe learned something along the way that was like an aha moment? Great question. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've learned one of the best pieces of, advice or, or, or I, it wasn't really advice as much as it was a work habit that I ever got that has, I found from my own work just for me, but I always give this to artists as well. That's benefited me the most was something that when I worked for Arista that Clive Davis said when he was talking about, you know, 
habits that you as a business executive need to employ in your professional life. And he said, you have to be committed to genuinely um, reading and, and have a, a strong curiosity about this business if you are to be successful in it. It cannot be something that is, you know, a hobby or at a distance. You have to be reading. You have to be searching out information. You have to be searching out, you know, why is that? You have to be reading five, six different things on, on so forth. If you're to be successful, he's talking about executives. He's not talking necessarily about, uh, you know, other elements. But I say that to artists as well. I say, if you are to be a successful artist in today's world, I believe you have to have a genuine curiosity about how this business works because there are no systems right there where I can say, oh, go to so-and-so and and they will just do it for you. Go to a manager and and, and they'll give you a career. You know, if you don't have that and, 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 and part of that, Bobby, I think comes from a strong sense of curiosity. It comes from a strong work ethic. You have to have that sense of curiosity, I think, as an artist in order to be successful today because it's so difficult beyond just your own talent. I mean, your talent is something that you have and that you nurture, but if you don't have the curiosity about how this industry works for you as an artist, if, if, if this is to be your career, I'm speaking to you now as if you're asking advice for artists. And I tell this to artists who are genuinely interested in having it be their career, not a hobby. As you and I both know, you know, music can be a wonderful hobby. (laughs) <laughs> you know, great hobby, but it doesn't mean it's your career. And for those who it's really their career, there has to be that commitment to this as a way of life. I, th- that, that's the best piece of advice that I ever got. And I think that to me was what Clive was saying, is, you know, in his own way. He was saying that it ha- you have to have that sense of curiosity where this is really a way of life for you. It's been a way of life for him, you know, his whole career. And I believe for artists who are successful – I look at the people who are successful in our business today, in the business side and in the artist side, the new ones. I'm not talking about the famous ones, but the new ones. And by God, every single one has that in common. I've never met an artist who, you know, casually had a career. Not not in the last 10, 15 years, I haven't. No one that I know of has a career who's making money in music, like they're, they're making a living doing this. They may not be famous, but they're making a living who doesn't have that kind of strong sense of curiosity about how things work, where they're going to learn about how things work for themselves, for their own career. I'm sorry, no one out there, no agent, no manager, no publicist is going to do that for you. And for those people who don't believe that, I think they were, they're in for a, a rude awakening. That, that was probably the best advice I ever got was that, you know, you have to genuinely be curious and passionate and interested in the world that you're choosing to make your career in. Otherwise, find a career and find a, a, a job and a work that, that you are that, that does have that for you, you know? Yeah. Because um, this business is, a, is, is, you know, it's changing and it's, it's not impossible, but it requires a different skill. It requires a different set of skills today as a person. Um, I think then, 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 and then I'm talking to artists now than it did in the past. And I think even to executives, people want to be in the business today, especially if you want to be in the business side. If you don't have that strong sense of curiosity, if you're not reading, if you're not keeping abreast and networking, I, I don't know what to say to you. I don't know how you're going to get that job or, or keep it. You can find out more about Rich and the Music Business Registry at musicregistry.com. That's Music Registry all one word, dot com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. To listen to the episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyownercircle.com or find an iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, and now Radio Public. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyownercircle.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. Bye.